volunteer from Canada. She actually has worked for two, uh, almost 20 years uh, on Bay Street in Canada in the financial district and has a lot of interesting perspectives on what finance means to her. Has done a number of things including the television show there. So she, I'm excited to hear her perspective and thoughts on what you guys can learn from her and her career. So Elizabeth, come on to the stage please. How's everyone feeling this morning? I'm great. Yes, I'm dobra. Before I begin, I just want to thank Macedonia 2025 for inviting me here today. I need to let everyone know the impact that you've had. I uh, was flying in from Istanbul to Skopje, and the man sitting beside me, we started talking to each other, and he actually told me that he recognized me from the Macedonia 2025 promos that you were doing in the website. So congratulations to all of you for really putting an effort out there and actually educating and pe letting people know who you are and what you stand for. <clears throat> I'm extremely delighted to participate at the Macedonia 2025 summit and it's so gratifying to see so many high level and passionate individuals here, especially this morning and it is early. No, I was just here in July for my honeymoon, and I was in Skopje in 2017, and 2013, and 2016, and probably half a dozen other times before that. And it really feels good. It feels great to be back in Skopje again, and actually live my heritage, my Macedonian heritage. FOMO, YOLO, debt and discipline, the things that I've learned from Finances Personal. Today I'd like to talk to you about my TV show, Finances Personal, why I created it, and what I've learned from it. Now, I'm a first-generation Canadian, and although my TV show is taped in Toronto, it is on YouTube for the whole world to see. So everyone has access to it here. I think it's important for you to understand where I came from and how my passion for financial literacy actually evolved. So let's step back to 1961, the year my 19-year-old mother from Prilep and my 24-year-old father from Butola met. My mom and dad were introduced to each other by her sister and older brother in Novi Sad, New Year's Eve, 1961, and on New Year's Day, January 1st, 1962, my father proposed. February 11th, 1962, they got married. And then they left Yugoslavia as strangers with one suitcase and no money. They slept on park benches in Italy, France, and ended up in a displaced persons camp in Germany. But while they were in Germany, they heard about a church in the United States that was lending people money for immigration to Canada, of all places. So they borrowed the money from the church in Chicago and got on a boat for their 11-day journey across the Atlantic. Now, my mother thought she was going to die on this boat or in the ocean, as every single second of that journey, she was sick, pregnant with me. Now, in November 1962, they arrived in Montreal, and in the middle of the night, they were ushered onto a train that took them to Toronto. When they arrived in Toronto, they had the same suitcase, but they had $130, and that was it. They were married for nine months, still strangers, and pregnant with me. They didn't speak English, they didn't have family, they didn't have friends, they had no support and they didn't have a place to stay. And they were indebted to the church in Chicago. Goal number one, find a place to live. Goal number two, get a job. Goal number three, pay off the debt to the church in Chicago. Now through discipline in living a frugal lifestyle, my parents quickly learned how to save every penny. Every single penny that they made was accounted for and saved. So as a child, I would walk across the street, and if I saw a penny, I'd pick it up, because it was important for me to save as well. Now, these coins were just a nuisance to people because they jingled in their pockets and they just throw them on the street. But when you add up every penny, it amounts to a lot. So that's where I learned to live my life without any debt and to save every penny too. Now, I was nine years old when my mother first took me to the bank to open up a savings account, and that's when I realized that savings is important for everyone. My mother taught me to save, to not be wasteful, and to buy everything on sale. And my father taught me that cash is king, 
If you can't afford it, don't buy it. Period. Now, those were the two special pieces of advice that my parents gave me, and that stuck in my brain regarding financial literacy. And that is all where it began for me. Now, one of the main reasons why I created Finance is Personal, my TV show, to host only female guests, and the content to appeal to women and children, is because so many women in Canada end up retiring in poverty. That's shocking, isn't it? But I can tell you that it's happening all over the world, and here in Macedonia too. Too many women were brought up old school, the old-fashioned way, where the man would be the main breadwinner, the main decision maker. He would make all the household money and pay all the bills. But then, when the husband died or there was a divorce, the woman's lifestyle would change, and many of them didn't know how to write a check, how to pay bills. Or even where their money was. A research paper by Statistics Canada, just released last month in October, said in 2018, female employees between the ages of 25 to 54 earned an average of $26.92 an hour, while male employees made $31.05 per hour. Women make $4.13 per hour less than their male counterparts, meaning. For every one hour, for every one dollar a man makes per hour, a woman only makes 87 cents. So when you also factor in that women live longer than men, we realize that we truly need more money to retire and take care of ourselves. So when women are also the family matriarch and they pass down family wisdom to their children, who here has a strong baba or a strong mother? I'm sure everyone in the audience can attest to that. So this is the main reason why I focused on women and children, on finances personal. But the other reason was because every financial TV show that I watched, or any financial panel that I've moderated or watched, has predominantly been filled by a male. So what I wanted to do was showcase women and give them a voice. And it really doesn't matter how much money you make, or what you do for a living, or what your financial status is. The bottom line is, we all need basic financial literacy to keep us out of debt and to relieve our stress and anxiety. You heard me right. Yes, stress and anxiety are attained to a lack of financial literacy, and over time, that stress and anxiety will eat away at you and debilitate you and take away your health. Financial worries are a massive trigger for these disorders. Now we all want and need money to survive, to retire, to give us a good lifestyle, and to actually give us good health. Years ago, when we wanted to purchase something but we couldn't afford it, we would put money aside for something called a layaway. So what you would do is go into the store, and if there was a new dress that you wanted to buy but couldn't afford it, you would go to the store and give them twenty dollars. And every week, you'd go back and give them another twenty dollars until you bought it outright. Nowadays, we want everything immediately now, quick gratification. But in order to have that now, many live month to month, paycheck to paycheck. They borrow more money every month and try to make ends meet, which causes a lot of stress and anxiety. And people are having a hard time coping, and I totally get that. We're running to appointments. We're stressed at work. We're stressed. We don't have work. We have family stress. We have family obligations. And then there are so many other things that we have to worry about, like social media. Social media exacerbates FOMO. FOMO, the fear of missing out, and YOLO, you only live once. Why are we so obsessed with labels and having more? Does it give us status? Does it elevate us in the world? Does it make us feel better? Does it give us more likes on social media? Because I can tell you right now, likes on social media don't pay your bills. It's just that instant gratification for our ego. I want a show of hands here, and it's a yes or no question. Does social media put us into debt? Who believes it's yes? Who believes that social media does not put you into debt? Okay, I didn't see any hands here. Come on, people. Yes, 
No. Okay, the answer is social media puts us into a lot of debt, believe it or not. FOMO and YOLO and impulse spending put us into debt, and they're all bad for our health. FOMO, the fear of missing out. It's that modern day version of keeping up with the Joneses, which in North America is what? My neighbor just bought a new car? Mine has to be bigger, better, shinier, faster. So I can outdo my neighbor. Now, this has been in all of our lives for centuries. Part of that has also been, or what will the neighbor say? Did you also know that if your neighbor wins a lottery, you will eventually declare bankruptcy? Because you'll go to buy the bigger and better version than what your neighbor did. So whether you can afford it or not. Now, this is a quote from the Federal Reserve Bank in Philadelphia, USA. The larger the dollar magnitude of the lottery prize of one individual in a very small neighborhood, the more subsequent bankruptcies there will be from other individuals in that neighborhood. So what does that tell us? For example, how many of you here on social media strive for the best photo? Because I know people will take 100 photos before they post that one perfect one. But did you know that many young women are going into debt now because of social media? Because they can't be seen wearing the same dress twice? Or men and women will take a quick, inexpensive trip to somewhere for the weekend to post the perfect photo and show their status? The problem is, with these inexpensive trips, there are other charges that go with it, like a taxi and a hotel and restaurants. And people are now renting an hour of time in a private jet hangar. They're not renting the private jet to go anywhere. This jet is sitting in the private hangar. People are showing up with a bottle of champagne and a glass of, well, a glass full of champagne so that they can take their photos and post them on social media to show a status that they don't have. I'm here to tell you that it's okay to live within your means. And who cares if you wear the same dress twice or ten times? And it's okay to tell you and your friends that if you don't have money to go out, that's fine. Twenty years ago, I purchased a very large house in Toronto that I couldn't afford. And there were times when I had to be creative to put food on the table. I participated in all the focus groups that would pay me at the time, and I actually went and became a server at a friend's family party. I also told my friends that money was tight and that I couldn't go out for dinner. At the same time, I was taking the executive marketing course at Queen's University, and I had to write two exams for my professional financial planner in order to get my Canadian securities license to be an investment advisor. I had to get all this done as well before I went in for major surgery. So there was a lot of pressure. So I sent a mass email to all my friends and basically told them to leave me alone and not contact me for six months. And they did. But I was disciplined. So within six months, I did the course, I wrote and passed both exams, I saved my money because I didn't go out, and then I went in and had some surgery. The key thing was communication and discipline. I communicated with my friends, and we were all on the same page, so there was no pressure. But we also have to communicate with our loved ones and our partners. Whether we're living with someone, getting married, or we're married, we really must discuss our finances and communicate our anxiety and stress in order to survive together. Now, when we're dealing with those negative, because we all do, those negative and worrying voices in our head, remember, when you've got those negative voices in your head, you're the only one who actually sees and hears them in your head. So it's easier to discuss this with someone close to you so that you have a sounding board and you can get those thoughts out quicker and better. And then you have YOLO, you only live once. There are many people who look at these expensive designer advertisements and famous people's Instagram posts and think, I'm going to buy that really expensive item because you know what? I work hard and I deserve it. And why shouldn't I? YOLO, you only live once. But the problem with FOMO and YOLO is that they give you a very short-term high and long-term payment plan without mount, with a lot of mounting debt. Now, have you ever just thought, how many hours do I have to work when I have to go and purchase something? 
I'm Canadian, so I'm going to use the dollar as a reference, but you can easily substitute the dollar with the euro or the denar. Winter is coming, and as you know, Canada is very cold. When I left, it was minus 20 Celsius. So it gets chilly, so you actually need a really good coat. And there's a specific coat that most people will go out and buy, and it's $1,000. So let's say that you purchase that winter coat for $1,000, and right now your salary is $20 per hour. You'll have to work 50 solid hours in order to pay for that coat. Is it worth it? Impulse spending is another cause of stress and anxiety because it adds to mounting debt. Do you know people who go out shopping every day and have to buy that specific item? And when you look at their closet, it's all hanging there with the price tags. They haven't worn it, but they just need to have it. And, the <laughs> and they just purchase that something because of the mood that they're in or because everyone has that and they need to have it. But with that mounting debt comes denial. Some of the symptoms of debt denial are underestimating how much you owe, not answering the phone because you think it's a creditor, so you just don't answer your phone anymore. You leave your bills unopened and just stuff them in a drawer, so you kind of hide them. That's actually called the ostrich effect. You know, if out of sight, out of mind, how the ostrich just sticks their little head underground. Opening a new credit card is also a, another one where your old one is maxed out, so you decide you need to go get a new one, or you tell yourself that everyone's in the same situation. So it's okay, everyone, my friends are all doing it. But these five points just lead us into more debt, because with denial and ignoring payments, your interest fees grow, late debt payments grow, and our debt just keeps on growing and getting bigger with no end. But the problem is reality rules, but that doesn't change your debt situation. So while we've been discussing stress, anxiety, and denial with your finances, I think it's really important right now to talk about the reality of credit card debt. How many people here, show of hands, use their credit card all the time? It's quite a bit. Now, I don't want you to answer this out, out loud, but I want you to think about this question. Do you just pay the monthly minimum? required on your credit card, or do you pay it off in full every month? The reason why I'm asking is, that coat that I was talking about, if you purchase that coat with your credit card, you now have a $1,000 credit card statement. And if you pay $25 per month, which isn't even the minimum, it'll take you 5.2 years and the cost of an extra $439 to pay it off. So now instead of working 50 hours, you're working 72 hours to pay off that one coat. Now how about if I add a zero to that $1,000 and now it's $10,000? So now your credit card debt is $10,000 and you only pay the $25 per month, still not the minimum. It'll take you 42.3 years to pay it off and it'll cost you an extra $27,328. Crazy. Meaning that you will pay an extra $27,328 in interest and work 1,366.4 hours. And that's literally throwing over $27,000 out the window instead of keeping it for savings for an emergency. An emergency fund. We're going to talk about that soon. Now, I just received my credit card statement before I came here. And it was just over $13,000, which is not normal for me, but I got married in July, and this was just the alcohol portion of the wedding. For $130, $11,000 was the alcohol portion. That's a lot of money. And I'm not telling you this to tell you that my friends drink a lot or they had a really, really good time. However, there's a point here. On my credit card statement, it said, for a $13,700 credit card statement, the minimum payment is $10 per month. If I only paid the minimum $10 per month at an annual interest rate at 19.99%, the estimated time to pay off my credit card balance is 108 years and 11 months. I'm just going to say that again, because that will really, really hit home to people. 
$13,000 credit card statement, which quite frankly isn't a lot, because there are a lot of people around the world that, that walk around with a lot of debt, to pay off, no, to pay the minimum $10 per month at 19.99 interest rate, it's almost 109 years. So when you decide to just pay the minimum, think of that, because that's really, really important, and that'll save you so much in the future. So right now, what do we need to do? We need to focus on our money mindset. Hey, how are you? How have you been? That's pretty much the conversation when you see a friend. And what does everyone say? Oh, I'm so busy. Well, yeah, we're all busy. We are so busy that our minds are running on autopilot. We make appointments for the doctor, uh, appointments for our nails, reservations at a restaurant. But very rarely are we making an appointment with ourselves to think about money, savings, and our finances. So when it comes to finance, what do most people look at when they think of money? I don't have time, I'm not interested. That's a typical response. And the other one is, I don't understand it, and it scares me. The mental juggle that we're all doing right now is so high, it's preventing many, especially women, from money empowerment and discovering that money can actually do for you. Now, aside from saving the mandatory minimum 10% from each paycheck, we need to put money aside for an emergency fund. Remember I had mentioned that earlier? And particularly our retirement. So, what is an emergency fund? Okay, you have a car and you need to have it repaired. You have a house and your roof needs to be replaced. You have an accident and you break a tooth, you need to replace your tooth or, God forbid, a death of a loved one. Emergency funds are used for everything and anything in case of an emergency. Wanting or needing to go on a short-term vacation or buying a Louis Vuitton handbag is not what the emergency fund is used for. Save your money and forget that it's there until you're faced with an emergency. Now, behavioral finance is the new buzzword right now. It's a new buzz phrase, and it's increasingly used in advertising to get you to either save your money or spend your money. For example, there was a juice company in Florida, and they were really struggling with lagging, uh, lagging orange juice sales. And through time, you know, they came up with a strategy and decided to put the word fresh in front of their product. So now they were fresh squeezed orange juice, and their sales took off like crazy. That's behavioral finance. So now you can also look at behavioral finance as a way to save your money. Now, if I asked you to put aside and save $100 per month, how, how, how hard would that be for you? Because a lot of people have a hard time wrapping $100 around and, and, and saving it. However, if I told you to put aside $5 per day, aside, or a euro, or 50 dinars per day, doesn't that sound easier to maintain? And quite frankly, $5 per day times 30 days will save you $150, and not just the 100 that people are afraid of. And it's easier to do psychologically, and you save more money. The other thing is it takes humans three weeks to learn a habit, 21 days. So after that habit, after the 21 days, the three weeks, it's, it's actually automatic, and it just happens. So if you actually put away $150 per month at $5 per day, within a year, you will have saved $1,825. Now, I don't buy my lunch when I go to work. I don't buy my coffee or tea. I make it in the office. And because of that, I've been able to save thousands of dollars through the years. Now, right now, November in Canada is Financial Literacy Month. So on November 1st, I started a five-day per, uh, day per day savings campaign on my Twitter account, at Nienomovsky, with the hashtag Savings Challenge. Today's day 15, which means if you began following me, and you began saving on November 1st, you will have saved $75 so far this month. And you're halfway there, which is pretty good. And it really is an easy process. But in order to build wealth, you need two things to help you be successful. Number one is discipline, and number two is that you need to be frugal, just like my parents. Now let's talk about being frugal. I was taught to purchase everything on sale, which is what I do, or what I like to do. For instance, one of the Canadian designers, dress designers, was closing their store in my neighborhood, and they, sold, they sell dresses between $1,000 to $2,000 each. But the last day of the sale, all the dresses were $99.
So I was lucky enough to go in and purchase the dress for $99 and save $1,200 because that dress was $1,300. However, there are people out there that will look at that dress and equate it to only being $99 and think it's only worth $99 and not the original price. We need to get away from that mindset. Think about price and value. Warren Buffett said, price is what you pay, value is what you get. Remember that. And now let's talk about discipline. The number one issue people have is lack of discipline because people throw the math out and reason out the window and suffer from FOMO and YOLO. Do you remember those two from the very beginning of the talk? We need to focus. Now we've come full, full circle and what have we learned? Okay, there's five practical steps to living a debt-free and stress-free life. Stop impulse buying, don't live in denial. Save $5 per day, after 21 days it'll become a habit and it'll be easy for you to, change, to save for your emergency fund. If you can't pay off your credit card, never just pay the minimum. Remember 109 years? Don't get sucked into FOMO or YOLO. Live a disciplined and frugal life. Cash is king. If you can't afford it, don't buy it. And pay yourself first. Buy on sale and save. And think of these seven letters of the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. They are there to utilize and help you live the five practical steps. A, accountability. Be accountable to yourself. If you cheat, you're cheating yourself. B, budgeting. If you're struggling to make ends meet, create a budget, and that's a totally different speech another time. C, communication. Communicate with your loved ones when you're stressed or full of anxiety and talk about money. D, discipline. Make a plan and stick to it. If you can't go out, tell your friends and save 10% of your paycheck always. E, education. Learn about financial literacy and never stop learning. F, live a frugal life. G, goals. Create your own goals just like my parents did and stick with them. Now, everything that I've said today here is not just about personal finance. It can easily be applied to your business if you're an entrepreneur. Because, just remember this, if you take on debt, you no longer own yourself or your company. The bank and credit cards own you. Thank you so much for your time. It was so much fun to be here. You guys have been great. And don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Enomofsky. Thank you so much.